All right, so Simon Dune, and welcome to our Marist College Fashion Department Saturday series. And so for all the students and faculty who are watching this, I'd like to introduce my very good friend, Simon Doonan. Simon is a fashion icon, a best-selling author, and the recent creative ambassador to Barney's. Barney's has recently uh, shuttered its doors. And then Simon is also one of the two judge star judges of making it on nbc which is an amazing show simon have i left anything out um my knighthood i'm just kidding <laughs> that's that was a lovely that's introduction imminent. thank you <laughs> you're welcome and thank you so much for joining us today so uh simon i've known you for a long long time pretty much when i moved to new york we met and you were working at that time at barney's creating the most amazing windows that became a sensation, a real art form, and very much a kind of um, social commentary. Can you speak just a little bit about your experience at Barney's and sort of everything that you created there and all the, all the opportunities that happened along the way? Um, yes, I was living in LA in my 20s and just sort of living la vida loca and having fun. <laughs> and. Uh, doing some window display i had a little t-shirt business so and then um through a series of weird circumstances i met the guy who um owned barney's and he was just about to sort of expand the vision of the store and and uh make it uh, more oriented towards women and high fashion and blah 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 and he offered me the job in new york so I um, took this job, which was a big switch for me because I was used to sort of making my own schedule and being free and easy. So suddenly I had this corporate show up at 8.30 every day kind of job. Yeah. And, um, but I have no regrets. That was 1986. So retail, I will say retail has been very good to me. And um, um, we can talk about that later, but yeah, retail always was sort of very inclusive and very diverse and, and like it enabled a lot of people such as myself to get a foothold, become financially self-sufficient, blah, blah, blah. And so now we have a challenge where retail is receding. You know, how do you replace that for people? Well, we, we'll talk about that when we yeah, get to you. We will. And then so along the way, you started to write books and your first book was about your experience as a window dresser, Confessions of a Window Dresser. That was your first book, right? Yes. I mean, I had no idea about being a writer. I'd uh -huh. used the other side of my brain my entire life. And I, um, uh, somebody said to me, oh, you have all these pictures of windows. You, before you throw them in the trash, you should do a book with them. So I did a book and they had me write the introduction. And, and then I, they said, it's very funny. You should expand. So we put more writing in. And then I got my column at the New York Observer. And I did all this while I had a full-time job. Yeah. So, um, but it was, my career took an unexpected turn. And I guess the takeaway from that is you should always sort of just be open to new things. And, and uh, I started writing in my late forties. And since then I've done about seven books and, written loads of columns. So it, that's been incredible for me to have this second act, second career that I hadn't anticipated. Um, and, uh, you know, no one, people didn't hand it to me on a plate. I had to sort of really throw myself into it, but it was just very, it was just great. Cause by then there's nothing I hadn't done in a store window. I'd had enormous experience in advertising and store design and every aspect of retail. So having, having that fresh incarnation in when I was almost 50 was great. And I think that's another, another good takeaway for the students. Your career can have, just as you've now entered academia, you know, your career can take all kinds of unexpected turns. It's not just over at some point. Exactly. And that's what I found. It's the whole idea of, of, of adapting, pivoting, being open to new opportunities. And yeah, it's, a, it's always been an interesting trajectory for, uh, to watch people and how their careers have shifted and what they we become interested in different things at different times. Okay, so I want to talk about 
this. This is such an amazing book. And this came out, was it last? It was in 2019. Yes, it's a, it's a year ago today it came out. Okay. So it's Drag the Complete Story. And I am teaching a course, which I'm very excited about, called The History of Modern Fashion. And basically, I'm starting in 1850 and going through today and talking about a lot of the different social movements, political movements. And even in the beginning of my research, I found that drag was playing a big part in what was going on in society. It, I didn't see it necessarily as a particular fashion movement, but it, I, obviously drag has always been there, but it was really interesting to find different people that were popping up throughout history that were uh, drag queens and drag kings. And I want to ask you this one question before we, before we dive deeper into this. So part of my research, I found this, uh, this one gentleman who I guess started calling himself a drag queen. And this was just as the hoop skirts had just, uh, they, had, they had been a big part of fashion, the, the, the hoop skirts. And apparently he, and you may have a different take on this, he had turned the, he had found, coined the word drag because of the idea of dragging your hoop skirt through the dirt. And that was what I found was one of the origins of drag. I don't know if you have a different take on the history of the actual word itself. Well, there is um, another theory and that goes back to Elizabethan England, um, where um, in the time of Shakespeare, and of course, Shakespeare's full of drag because yes. all the female roles were played by young young males, teen and teenage boys, played Cleopatra, Lady Macbeth. Those were all played by by young boys. And um, the way it worked was back then in the Elizabethan times, um, they had these things called sumptuary laws, which had a direct impact on fashion. What they were was you were not allowed to wear velvet, brocade, um, embroidered, gold embroidered. You weren't allowed to wear the super fancy um, fashion signifiers unless you were one of the aristocracy. So there were actually laws that prohibited that. So what would happen was if the aristocracy, when they were ready to discard their clothing and the clothing back then for the aristocracy was very elaborate like you see those portraits of elizabeth the first sure. they have corsets with wooden slats in them farthingales um it's fascinating and immensely complicated so the aristocracy would sell their clothes to the theatrical production so the servants would take the clothes over to the Globe Theatre where Shakespeare was producing Hamlet and all these plays and sell them to the theatre. And the, the, aristoc the, the servants couldn't, they couldn't wear them themselves because it was actually against the law to wear velvet. But so all these, co these contemporary, what were then contemporary costumes found their way onto the Elizabethan stage. That's why in Shakespeare, you have lines like in Cleopatra where she says, loosen my stays. And we all know in ancient Egypt, they weren't wearing right. corsets, but the, the young boy playing Cleopatra was actually wearing a corset yeah. because it was, he was wearing the clothes. And these clothes were very heavy. So that's the, one of the main determining things about them. So they started to refer to them as my drags mm -hmm. because if you were if you were playing one of those roles like in as you like it where one minute you're playing a boy next minute you're playing a girl you went from leaping around in tights and a little jerkin and then the next minute you had this immensely heavy velvet encrusted situation that you're wearing yeah. and you would be dragging it across the stage. so they would start referring to it as my drags so yeah. that's one that's a common um theory about the some of the origins of drag but obviously yeah. with language you can't be definitive about it especially right. that's so long ago yeah now what drew you to the idea of writing this book um i had just done a book on on soccer players with an english publisher called lawrence king and uh 
they said, because I love soccer and I've always been interested in, in how fashion and soccer interact because oh, yeah. of these fashion icons like David Beckham, George Best, Cristiano Ronaldo who has the most Instagram followers in the world. You know, these guys play a huge role in promoting brands. So I was very interested in that. So I did a whole book about it in time for the World Cup. And then they said to me, we want to do a book on the history of drag. Um, and you know, we there's no currently no book out there. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, why? Why would? Why now? Yeah. And then I realized that um, you remember in the '90s, people said drag was dying. Yes. You know, now that it became mainstream, it's lost its sizzle. What will you know? What propelled drag forward was often its marginal status made it made it sizzle made it exciting because it was sort of you know for, against the law in so many societies so what will propel it forward and so people were sort of saying oh it'll just fizzle and blah 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 but it didn't and i realized oh we're living in a time where there's this immense energy around the idea of androgyny and drag and gender and so what propelled it forward now i think is this gender revolution that we're living through, where there's this in completely revolutionary reconsideration of gender that's started about, I would say, five years ago, pronouns, you know, trans bathrooms, the whole transgender revolution that we're living through. And drag, drag and trans, as you remember, used to be incredibly separate. There was a yes, firewall absolutely. between them. Absolutely. You know, you couldn't, if somebody was a trans woman, to call her a drag queen was borderline insult. Yes, yes. But during the time I worked on this book, all that changed. These categories began to merge and there are um, trans women who happily identify as drag queens. There are straight women who identify as drag queens. There are, you know, drag is this thing that people can, it has its own vocabulary, its own, its own structures that people can take and put into other contexts such as fashion, you know, you can take the aesthetics of drag and replay it into fashion. So I thought, yeah, that's the reason to do this book is because this is an explosive time. And of course, the popularity of RuPaul's Drag Race, you know, right? um, that was the other reason. So the gender revolution, the, the popularity of RuPaul's Drag Race, I thought this is a great time to really have an examination of the history of drag. and my goal was to, to show young people that history is crazy it's insane it's brutal it's disgusting it's fascinating it's intoxicating it's like history is completely not what you think it is and so i got as many juicy facts as i could about roman emperors who like to dress up as prostitutes and yes, throw like themselves so. on the general public and um uh, you know, the castrati, which were the, during, when, in the early years of opera, um, the female roles were taken on by men who'd been surgically castrated when they were young. Like, history is bananas and fascinating. So I wanted to take young people and say, you know, we're very much focused on the time we live in now, but history has so many lessons to learn. And you realize, yeah, a lot of the crazy that we're living through now, it's like, you can see pre that previous periods when everything was convulsing and um, gender was often at the center of that, you know, during periods of massive convulsion, like um, the Weimar Republic, the Mauve decade of Oscar Wilde, yes. um, you know, the, the uh, gender was uh, central to these periods. Um, the fall of ancient Rome, you know, was there, there was a huge upsurge in, in drag and trans during that period. So whenever, you know, they, they seem to coincide, like the explosion of drag. Yeah. But try to make it accessible to people that, oh yeah, history's fun, it's mad, it's completely it bananas. Yeah, so I've been finding as I'm doing research for this class, the history of modern fashion, there are certainly the movements of the the bustle and the the cage crinoline and the corset because I'm still now I'm just finished I just finished with the mauve decade the 1890s 
But what I'm finding is all of these upheavals, all of these dress reformists, like in the, the, the name of the bloomers came from a woman with the last name Bloomer. There's so many women who were revolting against what they were meant to be wearing that was socially acceptable and started wearing these kind of cross gender. They, they started incorporating pants and <clears throat> there was such a Chanel. Yeah, exactly. But there was such a huge upheaval and society was very threatened by these people. They were afraid of sexual revolution. Now, I wanted to ask you a question. And again, your book is so amazing because it, it covers the history of drag. It covers kind of different tribes of drag. It also talks about drag kings, which I have such a fascination for. And you mentioned the drag queens of Victorian England. Can you speak to me? Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, I think one of the biggest shocks for your students is um, if you dive into drag in the Victorian era, what you find is during this immensely patriarchal period where men had big handlebar mustaches and it was about power and colonialism and the industrial revolution and women were always fainting and right. you know that's how they were characterized. There were these women that satirized the patriarchy by wearing drag, Vestatilly, I have a whole list of them. And they were the Lady Gagas of the period. They were immensely successful. They were rich. They were lived like kings. They rode around in limousines. They, you know, Vestatilly um, performed in New York and London. So she's going back and forward on steamboats. And um, uh, th there's a whole bunch of them in there who, like during this period where you would think, oh, you know, it was illegal for women to walk around in public in men's clothes and sure. vice versa. But they created these extraordinary careers um, and that people loved it. They loved to see the contemporary more satirized through, through drag. And right. um, there's a, another great example is Gladys Bentley. Yes. Who, um, she was part of what was called the pansy craze between the wars. You know, there was this sort of, um, explosion of creative decadence in many cultures. Um, obviously, in New York City, it was a sort of an incredible explosion of creativity in, in Harlem. And Gladys Bentley was this superb drag queen who wore white tuxedos with a top hat. And she, again, was very successful, lived on Park Avenue, had a limo and blah, blah, blah. So um, it's interesting to see. Um, and then, of course, the mid-century, mid-19th century, mid-20th century, mid century brought in this sort of primness, this sense of propriety that um, kind of, you know, ex expunged that area. And I, I think your, your kids should, your students should look into Gladys Bentley because her trajectory is very interesting because she ended up, because she then lived long enough to move into this era, era of, conventional thinking the mid-century the woman in the apron the man with the car driving off to work she had to then kind of dial back her her position um, and became sort of persecuted for wearing men's clothes and she wrote this article in ebony magazine i think it was how i became a woman again and she took female hormone again and it's actually very sad because society pushed her back from this position of freedom and, and creative expression. Um, so yeah, dr wow. looking at culture through the lens of drag, it's hilarious and brilliant and very enlightening. It sure is, yeah, because I'm, I'm gonna be speaking about the sort of like the post-war opulence and Dior, but then after it, really like the late 40s through the early 60s, it was this period of like suburban consumption and very rigid sexual and social definitions of this is what men did, this is what women did, at least on the outside. And that sounds like that was a period when somebody who was living a little bit more fluid would really have to, would struggle. Now, you had mentioned, which I love, again, your book really covers a lot of really interesting periods, but one is about, let me find the words here, the golden age of frock rock from the <laughs> 70s. Can you speak to that? Um, yes, I mean, I was there for this period. I'm proud to say, um, you know, I used to go to all the early Bowie concerts and suddenly um, in the early 70s, androgyny 
became a he's very central to music before that the mod mod style was sort of very very tidy very neat very masculine yeah. it was a reaction to the threadbare sort of poverty of post-war particularly in england the mod style and then after that came the hippie style bohemian style which was still very gender binary you know even though there was moving movement into androgyny with men having long hair but they were still hairy yeah with moustaches and yeah. and glam rock was like people came in from outer space and you couldn't tell what gender they were. Like David Bowie um, in his Ziggy Stardust incarnation was, he, he wasn't a man, he, was a, he wasn't a woman, he was this new version of a person that seemed immensely empowered. You know, when he took to the stage in those Kansai Yamamoto outfits at the Finsbury Park Rainbow, um, he, um, it, he was like in charge of everything. It was like, it was an empowered kind of completely new vision of gender that you then saw a bit with Grace Jones subsequently, that, that yeah. sort of completely futuristic, crazy. And so he spawned a lot, this new gender, this new sort of crazy frock rock thing with Mark Bolan from T-Rex, um, the New York Dolls. Yes. And then it became more and more mainstream. And then by the early um, 80s, in the early 80s, we have the Def Leppards, the um, Striper, you know, have a great picture. Then they look like they're, they look like women going to an aerobics class, you know, because they're wearing lycra and they have all this New Jersey Joan Cusack hair. And it's, it's fantastic. I mean, if you think about, but they were combining it with a sort of macho, a macho thing that's sort of yeah. what's interesting about it was like yeah i'm like this and I, but i'm in pink lycra with torrents of curly hair it was it was incredible and yeah yeah and and oh, oh in the 60s i have pictures of mick jagger wearing a michael fish mr fish i knew him um i think he's still around he had this wonderful shot called mr fish and he made dresses for men and Bowie wore them and Mick Jagger wore them. Mick Jagger's wearing one of them when he has the farewell concert after Brian Jones died. They had this wonderful concert in Hyde Park and Mick's wearing a, everyone thought it was a Victorian christening robe, but it's yeah. actually a dress from Michael Fish, which was wow. you know, very of the moment. And also Boy George, I know he was definitely, when I was, I guess, sort of 18, 19, I mean, he was, this new, new experience for me of, and I think for all of, you know, sort of America, especially and England and kind of the Western world. I mean, he, he definitely blurred a lot of the lines and challenged a lot. Well, do you remember where you were when you first saw those pictures of Boy George? And what, because I, I do, like, yeah. don't you think? I was in Cincinnati, yeah. I would think I was just finishing high school. And did you think he was a girl? Uh, yes, he was very pretty. Yeah, I mean, I was, I prided myself on being able to, having had such a vast exposure to drag and trans at that point. I figured I could spot anything anywhere. Yeah. But I, I thought, look at this girl. She's so creative and interesting. She's wearing these nice suit clothes, prints, mm -hmm. and he looked very au courant fashion wise. And I, she, I thought it was a girl. Yeah. And I was completely taken in until my friend in the record store said, no, this is Culture Club and that's Boy George. And he's yeah. blah, 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 blah. So he, he, um, he was uh, hugely impactful. That was very liberating. And it was very, a, a massive overlap with fashion. Because yeah. he was that whole period of body map and Vivian Westwood and Lee Bowery and and George was complete in Sue Close, C L O W E S, um, Rachel Auburn. They, these people really mashed up gender. Buffalo Girls came a bit later, but that's a fantastically interesting period for your students. That was very fertile. That that sort of post punk. Yes. Um, new romantic, exactly. going into Buffalo Girl. That period spawned so many creative people like Maria Cornejo. Yes. You know, comes from that era. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and she's one of the designers, one of my favorite designers. And um, 
we've been in touch because I really want her to come speak with the students and I want the students to come down and see her when things can kind of open up again, go down to her studio. So that brings me to, it's just kind of more of a general question. How do you think fashion is inspired by drag? I know that's kind of a large generalized question. Um, I think there are periods where fashion seizes upon it. You know, when the Glamazon came along, um, and RuPaul was having his first big hit with, you know, work on the runway. Yeah. Da da da. da. Um, that the, the sort of um, suddenly the glamazon took the sort of um, the tools of drag and the styles of drag and incorporated them into high fashion. So um, those that's why to look at those pictures now is so fun those outrageous versace ads with christy turlington and gladiator boots with 10 wigs on yeah you know like it's um it was sort of a startling power grab for women like i'm going to i'm a medusa you yeah. know staring you down on a runway and snatching your head around when you turned on the runway it was like uh it wasn't, and it was followed by the wave, which was a complete antithesis, which was introspective. You know, the girl who's sitting journaling at home and moping, whereas the Glamazon was going to go out and burn the city down if she didn't get her way. You know, so that was a period where drag emerged. And then I think Galliano at Dior, he played with drag a lot. Those Dior collections that he did. Um, you know, it played with Lip Sinka, it played with Lee Bowery, it played with um, makeup as Kabuki. And so it, it waxes and wanes, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. And again, yes, that whole kind of period of the supermodels and, um, and then kind of moving into the, the Kate Moss, more waif-like or the heroin chic, and that was a little bit asexual. Um, now in today's world, so we're seeing a lot of fashion that is more gender fluid, gender neutral. And as a matter of fact, something that's very interesting, one of the, this, the, the seniors at Marist in the fashion design and merchandising department, they create these capping projects that are sort of like a senior thesis. And one grouping of students created a business plan for a trans clothing company and they won awards and they're moving forward with it. And I think that that's a very new concept because it takes a very different sense of sizing for trans men and trans women because their, their specifications are very different from the kind of the cis man and, and woman. But I think what we're seeing as well is this incredible blurring where, like for example, Gucci, I think is a wonderful example um, in the past few years, there's been this, this thing where you don't really know or care whether it's a garment that's made for a man or for a woman. What is your feeling, especially about Gucci? Have you been um, excited about what he's been doing? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm like all Gucci all the time. Are you? I'm like, oh, yeah. Like uh, <laughs> when, he, when he first emerged and, and he did this, this outrageous um use of patterns and prints and icons and words and and i thought this is either going to be a catastrophe or the customer is going to embrace it and i literally began to go into gucci on a regular basis and i, I would go in there occasionally because they didn't have my size at barney's but talk to the salespeople and i'd say how was the customers embracing this suddenly there are tie neck margaret thatcher blouses for right. men and they're on mannequins. And I said, how is the clientele reacting to this? And they said to me, initially, I think the clients were a little bewildered and then they embraced it very quickly. Like there was, he, he had some visceral connection to the moment, which allowed him to um, seize upon this. And he did something that now, of course, everyone's copied in different versions, um, the way he, throws together these clothes that are kind of gorgeous versions of vintage things with new ideas thrown in, crazy patterns. Um, I think he's absolutely great and I think he's been hugely influential. And then he, I think two or three collections in, he embarked on that very gender neutral look where 
you couldn't tell if it was a sad boy or a sad girl with huge <laughs> face furniture glasses and limp hair. Um, like that's conviction. Yes. You know, I think the takeaway from that is, okay, fashion is more than just a hoodie with some logo slapped on it. Mm -hmm. Look at what he did. That takes enormous conviction to get this fabulous job at Gucci and then just do this complete about turn. You have to be using your gut, your intuition in a fantastic, audacious, so audacious. And then he was lucky because they obviously got behind it and produced all this oh, yeah. stuff. Because if you don't produce it, it does just collapse, you know? Yeah. So, you know, to get your the high ups around uh, behind you. He was, he was in a great position. So I'm a huge fan and um, I love that he sponsored the camp exhibit, uh, the yes. net and which seemed very apropos. Um, so yeah, props to him. Cause it's hard to think of somebody who's maybe Virgil Abloh has been very, very influential. Now the people who are influential, I think are like Rihanna, She's very influential, but in a way because the immense power of her persona, it's not necessarily coming from um, the kind of visual ideas that we saw at Gucci, but the power of her, her persona and people's collective perception of her through her music has made her an enormously powerful fashion icon. Oh, absolutely. No, I agree. It's been a, such an interesting time where the idea of, um, designers or personalities and where all of those like where does one begin and the other end and just coming back to gucci yeah at first when his collection came out for men i was it took me a while for it took a while for my eye to adjust because in my own collections through the years i love playing with gender i love playing with feminine boys masculine women and vice versa and i i love going you know experimenting through the gamut but when I saw this, um, we, you know, again, yeah, these kind of non-models, and I, I love his casting, but it really took me, for a, it took me a while for my eye to adjust. And now I'm fascinated by it because there is such artistry behind the work, but then the way that he puts it together and presents it is so new. And you're right, people are, I mean, I know the customers are buying it, but everybody is kind of using that as their... Uh, model for going forward. So let's talk about going forward. So, oh, and uh, the Dapper Dan thing, we should mention that. Oh, Dapper yes, Dan, please. like playing with logos, referencing Dapper Dan's appropriation earlier of yes. the logo and everything. That was all genius. Like to, to go back and re embrace something at the time that, you know, the time for Gucci, that was immensely, they didn't know what to do. They, they, the proliferation of their logo without them you know, any control over it, but they went back and they re-embraced that era as being enormously creative and have partnered with Dapper Dan. I think that shows, again, conviction, vision, um, you know, ideas. Yeah, and also just the idea of collaboration, which is, is something that uh, in this world, which is very, the fashion world can be very conceived and perceived as very cutthroat. Um, I think the whole idea of collaboration and people sort of, uh, putting their egos up on a shelf and working together to create something new. And I think that that's what we're seeing a lot more of. So I wanted to talk a little bit about retail because you've worked in the world and have done so many different things and have seen so many iterations of retail. And we have lately seen uh, the collapse of what we were traditionally brought up to think of as retail. And how are you um, envisioning retail, where do you see this this going? If 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 you have any thoughts on that, um, I am. Um, I have no idea where it's going. I'm sort of pessimistic about it, um, and I'm sad about it because um, for my generation, if you if you didn't know what to do but you needed to get a job, you could always get a job in a store, like That's Auntie Maine. You know, when Auntie Mame loses everything, she goes and gets a job selling roller skates at Macy's. And for me and my generation, we all worked in shops because yeah. we worked in factories. I worked in a factory when I was 16, and that's mind-numbingly boring. But those factories don't exist anymore, even if you wanted to go work in a 
bottle top factory where I was working. Um, but I soon discovered the hokey department store in my hometown. So retail was a refuge. You know, you could wear a nice clean shirt. You, you didn't make that much money, but you were with people all day. Da, 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 da. It was um, a great place. And then because it was very hierarchical retail, you know, I would start, I came in entry level entry level job in a display department. And over the years, I clawed my way up for, um, you know, assistant manager, assistant trimmer. Um, I've had so many titles like display manager, assistant display director, blah, 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 blah. So retail was a great place. And Barney's was really a utopia for that. You know, we had incredible people like myself who um, had come in entry level many years before and now had wonderful creative jobs. Jay Bell, Wanda Colon, Tom Calendarian. Those were all diverse, interesting, creative people who had come in entry level. So retail was this fantastic place. So I'm sad that that doesn't exist anymore. And the only thing I can say to young people is think about, think about the, the qualities that you have that you have control over. And now there's gonna be a feeding frenzy on these entry level jobs yes. when you go out into the workplace. These entry level jobs are gonna be hard to get. You're gonna to have to compete for them. And what, what are the factors which give you a competitive edge in that world that, you know, as you go into the job market, that you can control what are the ones you have control over like some people are a lot more talented than others some people can sketch beautifully some people can sew magnificently some people never bother to learn to sew in which case they should um i'm very big on that learn to sew because then you can make you know you know in busy it's raining outside you you can make clothes you can yeah. have an idea you actually can make it yes so and sell it on etsy you know be yeah. entrepreneurial so i think now um it's a great time to focus on the aspects of how you are, how you work that you can control. For example, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, do not underestimate what it means. I recall instances where people would be interviewing for a display job, but the, the enthusiastic person might beat out somebody who is maybe a little more creative because you think, oh, they're gonna show up. Yes. They're, gonna be, they're gonna be a great team person, you know, because display was always done in big teams. So um, like, I think enthusiasm and optimism, those are things that people actually have some control over. And if you aren't, if you're kind of a pessimistic person, you can fake it. It's yeah. very easy to fake enthusiasm and optimism. And um, when I'm doing our TV show, I think, I have to remind myself because sometimes you go into resting bitch face. Yeah. On TV, you're like that. And I think interested and amused. <laughs> you always have to look interested and amused. So you can fake it, but that don't underestimate that optimism thing. Optimism, enthusiasm. If you go into Tommy Hilfiger's HR department and there's 500 people interviewing for, um, you know, an entry level job and you are the one who's, just, you don't have to be insane, you know, right. and come in with balloons or anything like that. Yeah. Just be very like, and, and the other thing I was telling people, don't talk about yourself. Yeah. Talk about, Tommy Hilfiger is an incredible brand. I've looked at the Wikipedia page. I can't believe it, how long it's been around. I'm excited about the brand and I love what you did. And then you use Zendaya and then you use, before that, Beyonce. And like, and the, the HR person, I guarantee you, will be like, wow, this person actually did their diligence. They didn't come in and tell me for hours about how incredible they were. Yes. You know, even though they're only 21 and have not done too much, they, they talked about the company. They're actually excited about becoming part of our family here. So those two, those things, optimism, enthusiasm, um, you know, it goes a really long way to never underestimate it. I agree with you. And in the old days before COVID, I always said to have a great handshake and maybe that will come back. Um, and that was one of the things. So one of the things that my dad said when I told him I was going to go into fashion, 
um, they were a little bit crushed because of course they wanted me to be like go to business school or law school or you know be like a very traditional um, career person but my dad um, said well do it if you're gonna go into fashion do whatever you have to do do not have an attitude be as humble as you can if you have to wheel racks down 7th Avenue do it do not question anything learn from everybody and I think that 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 has really served me through the years because you never know who you're going to meet you never know who you're going to work with um it's all about great making these great connections and if you can present yourself with this kind of enthusiasm and interest and curiosity i mean i think that that advice is one of the is great advice because um yeah we're going into a very unknown world as far as you know what are those new jobs going to be we're looking at a lot of different things at the school looking at new technology um and trying to figure out what are those new opportunities going to be but i think at the at the core of it is this idea of being yourself being optimistic being open and curious and um, i think that that's a, a wonderful way to be and so do you have anything else that you would like to talk about while we have you here, Simon? Yeah, one more thing. Yes. Um, so yeah, retail is collapsing and that's very sad and I feel bad for you know students leaving college now, entering the job market, but the, the internet has provided new opportunities. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I'm on the show Making It and my co-judge yeah. is Dana Isom Johnson, who is the, um, trend ambassador for Etsy. So I become very, through her very familiar with the world of Etsy. So just say, for example, you left college, you, you needed to get a job, you've got some dismal job that you hate. It's not even in fashion, yeah. you know, whatever it is, just to pay your bills, which sure. is very important. Like you can literally go to the fabric store, make make a get an, one idea just be realistic start with one idea make make it like it you know i know i have a couple of friends who make beautiful dresses out of west african prints stuff something like that that's simple but do it better have this one great thing and then open your little etsy shop and start to put it out there and see what people think make them for your relative like never stop sewing yeah. No matter what's going on, you've always got that sewing machine is out on the table and you're making stuff and you're thinking about clothes and you're looking at what people are wearing and you're, you know, so, you know, keep that, that engine going. Even if you have to take some kind of gruesome job that you don't like, you know, people have done that for decades in yeah. order to pay the electricity bill. So you, but the key, the key is to keep your creative juices flowing on your own terms and the internet, which my generation, we didn't have that, we just had right. retail. So that is your new, your new creative outlet to, to connect with people in the world. And I think what Etsy does is unbelievable because people who couldn't afford bricks and mortar, and now you wouldn't want bricks and mortar, they can open an Etsy shop and uh, exactly. make something great. So it's a, it's, a, it's a grim picture, but there's incredible bright spots on it. And, you know, these upheavals in the culture um, always produce really interesting creative movements. So, you know, in England in the 70s, there was an incredible, and, and in America, financial collapse. Yes. You know, New York, London, they were dismal places. And um, there was a huge unemployment. We had a lot of... Um, uh, turmoil and whatever and that produced punk you know and punk was incredibly influential in fashion and all this creativity kids were can close out of garbage bags and you know that came directly out of the dismal that's why all those kids like boy george marilyn lee barry they all lived in squats yeah because they lots of people lived in squats it was that was the period where nobody really had much going on because it was a very depressed period. So, um, yeah, another reason to be optimistic, like bursts of fabulous creativity will oh, come absolutely. out. Now. Look what's happened with masks, the creativity. Oh my God. I have so many masks and I've been buying them all from Etsy and I'm finding all these incredible designs and patterns. And it's like, the, it's the new accessory that I want to make sure that 
especially when I'm on campus, that I have like, you know, it's all tied together and that the mask is like a statement. So Simon Dune, and you have been amazing. Um, I, on behalf of Maris, I really thank you for joining us. And I hope that at some point we can get you up to campus and show you our amazing facility and let you meet the students in person. Oh, I'd love to. I definitely come. Post COVID, I'm there. Yeah. On a bicycle up there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.